Hey, my name is Christian Bassnight, and welcome to Christian's Court, where I cover tennis from all angles. If you have not yet already, make sure you subscribe and click the notification bell so you're notified whenever I post more US Open updates throughout the tournament and help me reach my goal of making it to 20K subscribers. Almost there, just keep pushing, 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 y'all. Naomi Osaka, or should I say Naomi Bosaka, made her US Open return on Tuesday after missing last year's championships due to maternity leave. The two-time champion earned a statement 6-3-6-2 win over Elena Ostapenko in just over an hour. This was Naomi's best win since her maternity to come back to me for many reasons. For one, she was spot on from really all areas of her game. She won 80% of her first serve points, 75% of her second serve points, and she took 44% of her return points. And we know that return, her return has been kind of a sore spot and a weakness since this comeback. So she did a great job of making sure she was strong and solid on her returns. But most impressive to me was that she hit 19 winners to just five unforced errors. And this too, even more impressive when you consider that Ostapenko is a slam champion. She won rolling girls back in 2017 and she was the 10th seed and also Panko, she's had a solid season and some thought that she would just mop the floor with Naomi but not me also, it's Naomi's first top 10 win in over four years, and her last came against Kiki Burdens at the 2020 Brisbane Open. And it's crazy because that top 10 win came before Naomi won her last two slams at the 2020 US Open and at the 2021 Australian Open. I want to start a little discussion in the comments, by the way. Is this match Naomi's best postpartum match, or is it still that Roland Garros second round match against Igor Svantec, which she unfortunately lost. Osaka got pretty emotional after the match too, so clearly the win meant a lot to her. She explained that when she saw Coco Golf win the US Open last year, when she was watching Coco win from the stands, she desperately wanted to be back competing, but she wasn't really even sure that she could still compete at a high level due to the complications that came with having her daughter Shia, who she gave birth to in July of 2023. It just reminds me and really it should remind all of us to be more generous when it comes to Naomi and be less critical, a little bit less critical of her because we have to be mindful that she is still... I guess, relatively new on the comeback trail after having her daughter. And, you know, she almost, it seemed like she had a really tough time giving birth to her daughter. So definitely, she's had to overcome a lot of adversity. She's definitely had some shaky results this summer, but she proved with this performance that she definitely has what it takes to go deep in a slam once again. I also have to talk about the fit. Naomi came out wearing a big old bow on her back, as well as this removable Princess Tiana-like skirt. She, of course, had bows on her shoes, too. The Nike Custom Fit was a collab with fashion designer Yoon An and is a nod to Osaka and An's shared Japanese culture, so I thought it was neat. I know a lot of people were mixed about the fit, but I liked it. I thought it was pretty camp and different and edgy, and it will get more people talking and definitely get them tuned into tennis even more, so I'm all for it. The big question, though, for me is how far can Naomi go in this tournament? You know, she looks good now, but she's going to have to take it one match at a time for sure and her draw is pretty tough she next faces 2023 Roland Garros finalist Carolina Bukova in the second round which would not be easy Bukova is very crafty and she's definitely more consistent than Ostapenko and will make Naomi rally a lot more and that's where Osaka has kind of struggled in her comeback facing those players like Emma Navar who she lost to at Wimbledon who will make her play a little bit more who won't give her as many free points and who can also kind of mix in different slices different spins against her. Osaka also lost to Mukova the last time that she played her at the 2021 move to a Madrid Open. I think that it's going to be definitely a tough one for both players and I see this one for sure going the distance. And I think it's going to be tight for sure but I'm going to be sticking with Mukova as I had her winning this match in my tournament preview so I'm not going to jump ship. I'm going to stick with her ultimately win this one. 
um, in three sets, but I really could see this one go either way. Mukova, by the way, hit the shot of the day during her opening round win against Katie Bollinets. She hit a behind the back lob before winning the point with an overhead winner. Now, before Osaka took the court on Armstrong, Danielle Collins played her last ever Grand Slam singles match, falling to her compatriot Caroline Dolahide by a score of 1-6-7-5-6-4. This was an absolute heartbreaker for Danielle as she led Dolahide for much of the match, and she really should have won it in straight sets as she was up a set and a break, leading it 6-1-3-2. However, her two biggest weaknesses, the serve and the forehand, let her down a lot. This really was just a sad way for Danielle's slam career to end, with especially with the first round exit. And in Danielle, she really has struggled in the majors since she made that Australian Open final back in 2022, and she has not progressed past a major fourth round since that run. The tournament also had a retirement little ceremony thing planned for Collins, but she rushed off the court before Stacey Allister could even give her that ceremony. Stacey had flowers, but Danielle wanted none of that. Some people said it was disrespectful for Danielle to not stay, but I can honestly understand it. You know, she was pissed, especially seeing as though she should have won that match. And it kind of gave Serena Cincinnati 2022 after she hurried off the court after falling to Emma Raducanu. Um, 6-4-6 low in that match. Danielle still does have doubles with Caroline Garcia, so maybe they can make good use of that whole retirement whatnot then after uh, those two lose in the doubles. Osaka Ostapenko, by the way, was not the only high-profile match that featured two slam champions. Ember Raducanu and Sofia Kennan took the court on grandstand, and once again, the underdog prevailed, with Kennan winning it 6-1-3-6-6-4. I say Kennan was the underdog in this match because because Raducanu appeared in better form heading into this tournament as the American only claimed one main tour main draw win, singles win this summer. But Sophia is the type of player to really pop out and show... <laughs> show people at the slams and bring her a game. And that's exactly what she did on Tuesday night against Raducanu. She hit her ground strokes with such conviction, especially that forehand too, which shocked me because Sophia, normally that forehand is a weakness, but she was clobbering that side. Really, she just simply outplayed Raducanu. And yes, Emma could have had a cleaner start in the first set, but really it just came down, came down to the better player winning in the end. Perhaps if Emma had more match reps under her belt, leading into the Open, she could have been more successful. She only played one tournament between Wimbledon and the Open, which was at the DC City Open 500, where she lost in the quarterfinals. She did not get a main draw wild card into Toronto or Cincinnati, but she could have tried to play qualifying like Naomi Osaka did. Osaka, she played qualifying at the Cincinnati Open. Emma also did not even play a lead-up tournament the week before the US Open started in Cleveland or Monterey, the 500 tournament there in Mexico to get more match reps under her belt, which I thought that she might do, but she just decided to travel back home to Great Britain and prepare there after the city open. I get that Emma is injury prone and she kind of wants to work her way back slowly after undergoing that double wrist and ankle surgery, but she simply has got to play more tennis if she wants better results. Simple as that. Emma did say in her press conference after the loss that she wants to play more, so will she if she adopts a lengthier or bigger schedule in 2025. Now, day two of the Open was not good for the Canadians at all. The men went down pretty easily, and Felix Roger Alessim, the poor brother, he posted this wholesome tweet ahead of his match against the Czech Jakub Menzik with the caption, on my way to round one, the tweet just aged poorly because the 18-year-old Menzik took him to the woodshed, winning 6-2, 6-4, 6-2. This is Felix's 11th slam first round exit. And yes, Menzik is very talented, but Felix not winning a set is very disappointing to me, especially with how solid he looked this summer. I had to take my frustrations out and ratio him on Twitter with his little funny tweet playing on his little initial tweet, but hopefully he does not see it and block me. It's all love, Felix, if you're watching this. Meanwhile, Denis Shapovalov also suffered a straight sets loss, getting beaten by Botic van de Zanschloop 6-4-7-5-6-4. That was a bit disappointing because if Shapo had won, then it set up a blockbuster second round clash with Carlos Alcaraz. The Canadian ladies put up much greater fights for sure in their losses, and they arguably played the two best matches of the day. 
first Layla Fernandez and her cornrows bowed out to Russia's Anastasia Potapova. 266475. It was always going to be a tough one for the 2021 runner up Fernandez, as Potapova is very dangerous and she barely missed the cutoff for a seed, being ranked 38th in the world. Fernandez's struggles at the majors have continued for sure, as she has not made a slam second week since the 2022 Roland Garros Championships. A woman who's had an even harder time at the slams is Bianca Andreescu. She suffered a third consecutive slam loss to this very same opponent and Jasmine Paolini with a final score of 6-7-6-2-6-4. Paolini beat the Canadian at Roland Garros, Wimbledon, and now the U.S. Open. Triple homicide. The first set was undoubtedly the best set of the tournament thus far. It was over an hour long and full of big based on rallies from both women. Andrescu started to tail off in the second set and in the early part of the third set and she struggled physically, but she was able to muster up some strength and break back later on before the back-to-back stand finalist Jasmine experience prevailed in the end. It's got to be rough for Andrescu to lose and slams for the third straight time to the very same player. And two, you know, I just kind of feel for her a little bit because her draws have obviously haven't been that great in the majors, but still it's kind of crazy that she has not made it past a slam quarterfinal or better, you know, aside from when she won the 2019 U.S. Open. Like that's that's baffling to me, honestly. And I know injuries have plagued her, but still, once again, that's insane. Hopefully, she can stay healthy and be seated for next year's Australian Open so that way she does not have to face Paolini early on in tournaments. BB did have a nice exchange with the Italian up at net, too, saying something along the lines of, I thought I was going to win this time. Jeez. Credit to both these two ladies, though, for putting on a great match, especially Paolini. She was a very mature performance from her because Bianca, she played amazing and she for sure looked like she was on her way of finally getting her leg back. But Jasmine said, no, no, no. Um, and she proved that she's definitely here to stay as a mainstay in the top, you know, 10. And she's perhaps primed to go deep at yet another major. The lone successful Canadian on day two of the Open was Gabriel Diallo, who beat Jamie Munar in four sets. According to Miles David of the Tuned Into Tennis podcast, Diallo and I look alike. Let me know in the comments if y'all somehow see the resemblance. The world number one, Igor Fiancic, had a much tougher time on court than many would have expected. She saved three set points in the second set before finishing off lucky loser Camilla Rakamova 6-4-7-6. Iga will not be happy with this performance as she was very error prone hitting 41 unforced errors to just 30 winners. Now even though Rakamova is a lucky loser she is no pushover at all as she gave Sabalenka fits in DC and she want to set off the Belarusian. Still Iga will definitely need to improve if she wants a shot at a second US Open title. Iga now faces the 26 year old Ina Shibahara who was formerly known as a double specialist. But the Japanese qualifier scored her first main draw single slam win with a nail-biting 7-6 third set win over Daria Seville. Taylor Townsend's influence is clearly undeniable, but in all seriousness, congrats to you, Ina. And, you know, it proves that anything is possible. The other three seeds in Iga's section remain, and they're all Russians, as Anastasia Pavlyuchenkova, Mira Andreeva, and Lumela Samsonova won their matches. By the way, Ashton Kruger earned her first slam main draw win after six previous failed attempts. She beat Shuai Zhang, also known as Auntie Zhang by Tennis Twitter, in three tough sets. And Zhang, unfortunately, she now has a record-extending 23-match losing streak. Jessica Pagula's section looks a tad more open for her with Daniel Collins being bounced early. Pagula sent her good friend Shelby Rogers into retirement tonight and she'll now get another American in Kennan. Princess Dana Schneider is going to be the biggest threat to Pagula here to me right now as the 18th seed only dropped one game in her opening round win. Elena Rabakina won her first match since Wimbledon, scraping through in straight sets by Destiny Aeva. She could still play Caroline Wozniacki in round three, which I think could be pretty tricky for the Kazakhstanian. At the bottom there are two seeds in Beatrice Haddad, Maya, and Anna Kalinskaya, who progressed and they're still alive and kicking as well. And lastly, Jasmine Paolini's draw still looks rough as she now gets former U.S. Open finalist Karolina Pushkova. 
next. Yulia Putintseva eliminated the Monterey champion, Linda Noskova, in straight sets. Talking solely about the men's now, frenemies Yannick Sinner and Carlos Arcaraz faced a bit of adversity in their opening round matches before both men coasted to victory in four sets. Very few, including myself, expected 28-year-old Kwa Farley 2 to give Carlos Alcaraz a sweat on Ash Tuesday night. The four-time major champ was cruising by this Aussie opponent, being up a set and a break, but the switch flipped a bit as 2 started hitting bigger and landing his shots in while Carlitos sprayed more errors. The Aussie took advantage of the double fraught prone Alcaraz to seal the second set and was neck and neck with the Spaniard at 3-all in the third. But once Alcaraz managed to break in that seventh game of the third set, everything changed as Carlitos only dropped one more game in the match to take the 6-2, 4-6, 6-3, 6-1 win. Meanwhile, ward number one Yannick Sinner was broken four out of his first five service games by the 140th ranked American Mackie McDonald, who claimed the opening set and had an early break in the second. But after McDonald failed to consolidate that early break in the second, it was smooth sailing for the Italian who took the comfortable 2-6, 6-2, 6-1, 6-2 win. Sinner would now face another American in Alex Mickelson next. He won't face a seed until the second week as Nico Jerry bowed out for his second seventh consecutive loss since making the Rome finals. Tommy Paul and Arthur Fuse won their matches in four sets too. Dino Medvedev will be happy with his section after the exits of Felix Auger Aliassime and Stefano Tsitsipas. Tsitsipas fell to Tanasi Kokonakis, which I called because the Aussie is very dangerous and Steph does not like the conditions here in New York at all. Carlos Alcaraz would still meet Jack Draper in the third round, which would be the one to watch for sure. He could still meet Sebi Korda in round four, although Korda has a tough one in Thomas Makach in round two. And lastly, Alex de Menor and Hubert Harkoch seem to be recovering well from their respective injuries at Wimbledon. They progressed to round two. However, the most notable result here in this section is Dan Evans outlasting 23rd seed Karen Hatchinoff in a five-hour, 35-minute battle, and it's the longest match in U.S. Open history. This was a truly unbelievable win from Evans, who was down love four in the decider before ruling off the final six games of the match. Looking ahead to day three, Madison Keys and Francis Tiafo kick things off on Arthur Ashe while defending champions Coco Gauff and Novak Djokovic headline primetime. Armstrong has two of my popcorn matches. First, Paula Bedosa and Taylor Townsend, followed by Matteo Berrettini and Taylor Fritz. On grandstand, Casper Ruud plays Gael Monfils for the second time in their careers. And then finally on court number five, Peyton Stearns will look to upset 12th seed Daria Kazikina. That's all for my U.S. Open Day 2 recap, and let me know your thoughts on all the action from Day 2, including Naomi Osaka's excellent win and Danielle Collins' not-so-excellent last U.S. Open match. Also, will 2022 champions Igor Svantec and Carlos Alcaraz be able to overcome their relatively shaky starts to make another deep run here? Again, make sure you subscribe and click that notification bell so you all are notified whenever I post my Day 3 U.S. Open recap video. Thank you all so much for watching and for your support and i'll see y'all next time here on christian's court